Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is David Talbot. I'm Managing Director and Head of Research at Red Cloud Securities, and I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on uranium today. We are going to hear from Strathmore Plus Energy. We've got John DeHoya, Director and Technical Advisor, and uh, Terence Ozier, his VP Exploration. Now, their video seems to be in and out, but the audio sounds good, so we'll cross our fingers and hope it works. Uh, guys, are you there? Yes, yes. good morning. Excellent. Great. Thank you, guys. So now during today's webinar, they will provide an overview and outlook. Then we'll take some questions and you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. We'll get to as many as we can. Before we kick things off, first we need to discuss the fine print. During the Strathmore Plus webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I direct li listeners to the forward-looking statements outlined on page two of the company presentation. That can be found on the corporate website, strathmoreplus.com. For Red Cloud Securities, I'd highlight this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. So please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on Strathmore Plus. Now, with that said, why don't I turn the floor over to John and Terry to speak about the company. Take it away, guys. Well, thank you very much. Uh, since saying good morning, it has now turned into afternoon on our end. And uh, just as a brief uh, introduction here, uh, Terrence and I don't sit in the same office. However, we're starting drilling on Beaver Rim tomorrow. So I came up here. I was too excited to stay home. So we're doing this talk together today. Uh, we formed, Dev and I were talking in the summer of 21 when we formed our uh, Strathmore, uh, the newest Strathmore. And since that time, a lot has transpired. And I'm going to let Terrence cover most of that, but I'll go through the general part of the discussion. Uh, I think most of the viewers are aware there's a world energy crisis. And in order to fix the world energy crisis, we need to embrace nuclear power again. And uh, I say again because we've educated folks several times. This is my fifth cycle that I'm in right now. Uh, as you can see on the screen, there is an energy crisis. People may want to ignore it, but it's there. Uh, I think the biggest lead in to evidence for this if you look at the bottom of the screen, there says Japan turns back to nuclear power. That, to me, is one of the big indicators of where we're heading. So uh, with that in mind, this is a look at the world picture right now. Uh, demand for uh, uranium is up, and it's going to continue to go up. <clears throat> Uh, as you can see from these charts, and I don't like to read from the charts. They're there. You can view them. I, I kind of like to just talk along, but you can see on the right-hand side, uh, we've got nearly 440 nuclear plants in operation, 64 under construction, and 88 planned. And then there's another 344 plants proposed. This is worldwide. That tells you, tells me, there's a huge, going to be a huge demand for nuclear power. Now, one of the things about nuclear power, uh, we all talk about wind and solar and coal and gas and hydro and everything. Uh, out of the, the green energies that are being accepted by most of the public today, nuclear is the one that is a base load energy. It's there. It's stable. It's there day and night. Clear days, cloudy days, calm days, it doesn't matter. So the, the nuclear energy is good base load uh, energy. Uh, these are some of the things that have gone in the, in the industry on in the industry. You know, we can see there the the number two from the left, 
the we banned the Russian nuclear fuel imports. This is leading us to a nuclear renaissance for the world. China's planning to build 150 new reactors in the next 15 years. That means we're going to need a lot of nuclear power. This is a look at the uranium cycle. Uh, the general purpose for this is the time frame. People say, why is there such a difference between the, the cost of uh, uranium and the equity market? Well, take a look at this thing. We know there's a demand. We know the prices are going to go up. But this is a look at about a two-year part of the process, and that assumes you're mining it today. It's a, a long process. The mining, the milling, the conversion, enrichment. Uh, and, and then you've got to store stuff. This is a long situation. It doesn't happen overnight. It's very important for our industry to streamline the permitting, streamline the processing of nuclear fuel. Uh, why is Strathmore a, a good, solid uh, company right now? Well, this is a, a little bit of our background. Uh, you know, Strathmore... Minerals Corporation started back in the what 2005 time frame or so when Terrence hired on and I hired on about a a year later and when you look at this uh, it, it was the common denominator here is Dev and I, I hate to pat myself on the back but I'm a part of this I was part of it Terrence was part of it from the start. And look what's been spun out from the original Strathmore. We have Fission Energy. We have F3 Energy. We sold, divested most of our properties uh, to energy fuels. And then look what Fission has done. This, this is almost a, a nuclear reactor starting with uh, Strathmore. You know, I, I know that's... Uh, Kind of an egotistical thing to say, and I, I've said this many times. I call Dev Mr. Uranium, but look what has happened from his original concept. And we have just completed spinning out F4 Uranium. We've got a good management team at Strathmore, headed by Dev, Mr. Uranium. He's produced or developed several leading companies. He's got lots of awards. And I've been in with him on these endeavors uh, over the years. You know, I, I met Dev about 2005. Terrence hired on about a year before I did. And we've been going at this since that time. One of the things that is very encouraging in the nuclear industry are the new small modular reactors. Uh, I think we've talked about these many times, but Bill Gates uh, kicked off the start of construction at the SMR here in uh, Wyoming this past summer. I think it was June. So construction is underway. What a great sign. This is a look, uh, you know, we've chosen Wyoming. When Deb first called me, he says, where do you think we ought to work? I, and then we talked about all the development in the, in the world. And he and I both said, Wyoming is the place to work. When we had the original Strathmore, we started in New Mexico and Wyoming. We discovered New Mexico was not mining friendly. Wyoming is mining friendly. They, they like uh, the mining industry. They like uranium. People get permits here. People develop mines. It's a great place to do business. Now, this is a look at the Wyoming mining districts. And 
uh, Terrence is going to take over at this point and go through where we have our projects and talk about the projects and what the future is. Terrence? So as you can see, there's some major districts in Wyoming. The one that we are in is, is in the very center of the state where it says Strathmore Beaver Rim. That's in the Gas Hills District. It was the second largest mining district in the United States. Over 100 million pounds of uranium was mined there. It's the largest district in Wyoming. The second largest district in Wyoming is Shirley Basin, where our two other stars are at, Strathmore Agate Project and Strath or Night Owl Project. That area produced 53 million pounds of uranium, making it probably the fifth or sixth largest district in the United States. The other districts in the, in the state are the Crooks Gap Green Mountain District. John worked down there, too. The Red Desert mm -hmm. District, Sweetwater Uranium Mills there. Lost Creek ISR facility is there. In Shirley Basin, IS, uh, UR Energy is building their Shirley Basin um, satellite operation to the Lost Creek operation. I've heard rumors that companies are going to start drilling in the lower gas hills soon. In addition to our drilling starting tomorrow on top of Beaver Rim. Other districts in the area are the Powder River Basin, which is a very large district, includes the Pumpkin Buttes District to the north. Cameco Smith Highland Ranch has a facility in the Powder River Basin that's idled at the moment. Energy Fuels is going to bring their Nichols Ranch facility online. UEC's Gary Christensen Ranch has been brought online last month. And then the last one is Strata Energy the Lance Project up in the Black Hills District. They are bringing their facility online in the next six months, hopefully. And all right, they're, they're probably already processing material there. I'm not real sure about them. But those are the major districts. We, we picked the two that we know the most information about, that being the Gas Hills and, and the uh, Shirley Basin District. So the first project there we're gonna discuss is our Agate Project. This is over in the Shirley Basin. We drilled on it uh, last fall, 100 holes, to find a nice trend of mineralization there. We drilled another 100 holes this spring and summer. We'll be able to discuss that soon. UR Energy, you can see to the northeast. That's where they're building their, their, their satellite operation currently. It's going to be fantastic when that gets up and running. And there's all sorts of other mineralization around our area where UEC is to the west and Cameco to the north. So the nice thing about the uh, Agate project, it's shallow. We've, we've got mineralization defined anywhere from 15 feet to 150, 170 feet deep. And we have about, we have 85 claims. So we have a nice project area. We expanded on this year. Here's a quote from David. Everybody can read that. We're excited that he, that he, that he likes this deposit, obviously. And here's some of the drilling that we completed last year. This is the standard type of drilling equipment we use. It's a mud rotary drill rig, typical water drilling rig. You can see the cuttings in the middle. This is all from the same drill hole, Agate 16-23, where we've discovered 21 feet of 0.089 at 80 feet deep. And it appears to be within, the, uh, within um, groundwater. This is one of the pictures that... Cut of shows on the lower end where it says oxidized and reduced, that the small image, that's the typical gamma signature in a roll front that you're looking for. And above it, you can see some of our areas that we believe we were just within that interface to the nose on some of the drilling we completed last year. So we're excited that we have gamma, gamma signatures that are indicative of roll front mineralization on our project. So here's the highlight of the drilling that we have completed to date. You can see our project area where there's a light pink on the very north end of the drilling. That's all the, the drilling we completed last year. And then the darker pink outline with the darker red, uh, darker pink drill holes are, is the drilling we completed this year. The first area we drilled this year was that southwest deposit that you see on the very southwest. That turned out to be in the same lower zone as the drilling that we discovered mm -hmm. of the drilling that we completed last year. So we drilled that area and said, okay, well, we can, we'll, 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 we'll infill in between these eventually. So we then went to this area further to the east, that southeast deposit. And we had several hundred gamma holes, gamma logs for drilling that Kermit D completed on the project. They probably completed at least 600 holes. We've identified about 300. 
and not all of them are, are legible. And the ones at the very south base, I couldn't read them. I said, well, let's just go down there and go drill. And that's what we did. And we found a, a, a uranium deposit in the middle sand that we weren't expecting. So the middle sand is the predominant producer of, of uranium in Shirley Basin on the project, for instance, John used to work at years and years and years ago. And we're very excited about that trend. The mineralization, hopefully it's on the next slide. Let's look. Uh-oh. You guys see anything? Yep, I'm good here. Can you see it? No. That's the 2024 drill highlights. That I just, that's okay. We've got a picture here we can look at it. Okay, so on that on that map, you can see we highlighted the uh, the southeast drilling. So we were encountering mineralization, 15 and a half feet of 05, 14 feet of 046. These, these intercepts were starting at 40 feet, 38 feet deep. So we're very excited to get back out there and drill this fall on this project. And so after we uh, we drilled that lower area, we went back up to the north and we extended that whole trend several hundred, at least another, we doubled the trend of the length, length of that trend. So we're really excited that we're finding something. We expanded on our drilling, I mean, on our claim group out there. So we have more land to the northeast and more land to the southwest to, to drill on that claim, that trend that we found. So that's our plan for this fall, gather some core, that sort of thing. Let's see, what's the next slide? Okay, all right. And one of the other things we're working with is University of Wyoming. They received a grant from the state for $200,000 of research. And they, they're doing the research on our project. They're doing near surface geophysics. They've been out there all summer long doing this, this work. It's funding a PhD student, it's funding a master's student, and funding obviously a bunch of graduate students just to help them out during the summer work. So they are going to continue work on the process, on the project over the fall and then put together the information for the next year. This is some of the, this is one of the uh, uh, images they put together on the project. We're excited that it, it, it might be noting some, some uh, resistors down there that could be potentially the type of, the, like the mineralization, maybe that's causing this stuff, the metals in, in the roll front. We installed some groundwater wells this year. They've been doing some water sampling on that project. We're going to acquire some core this year that they'll be able to do some studies on, let alone ourselves, for disequilibrium. And um, this is the where we're at with what we're going to start tomorrow. This is the Beaver Rim. This is the Gas Hills area. The main production area was called the Lucky Mac Miracle Mile. It's approximately two and a half, three miles north of our project area. 40 million pounds of uranium came out of that two mile trend. And then the other major areas were obviously the East Gas Hills, the West Gas Hills, and the De Loma area. Over 100 million pounds of uranium was mined in the Gas Hills, predominantly from open pit mining. There was some underground mining and it was the first place they tested in situ mining back in the early 60s and then went on to successfully operate in Shirley Basin for seven, eight years during the 60s. That was the company John would eventually work with at Lucky Mac over there. So the big gray area in the middle, that's all controlled by Cameco. They, they probably have 30 to 40 million pounds historically defined. They show up to 19 million pounds of measured, indicated, and inferred on their website. The numbers have been much higher in the past, but this is the most recent number that we can see. So between the big purple area on the top, the Lucky Mac, and the Strathmore West Diamond property to the south is their peach project. And they probably have a 13 million pound resource in, in the peach project area. And the, the mineralization trends south onto Strathmore's West Diamond project, same as mineralization trends south from the Cameco onto the East Diamond project. And then further east, we have two projects called North Sage and South Sage. North Sage, there's a large gray area of small block of claims up to the north of it. Those were former Strathmore claims that were retained and are controlled by our Encore. I drilled on that project within tens of feet of our claim group and we hit mineralization. So it's one of the areas that we plan to target and extend mineralization onto our property area. We announced today that we're, we're 
going to commence drilling tomorrow. We also announced that we doubled the size of our, our claim group. We've had claims at the North Sage property, down at the South Sage, and we connected and expanded the West Diamond and East Diamond properties. So that's one contiguous property now is that it will just become the Diamond property. And another thing we've been working on over the year is, is working with U, UR Energy. They, they're very busy building up their Shirley Basin project. They're very busy down in, in Lost Creek, which is about an hour south of our Gas Hills project. We're excited that companies are building up in situ facilities around the state. By the end of next year, there are four or five mines will be operating, and that's really exciting. We look forward mm -hmm. to, to working with them in the future and expand Strathmore's position and hopefully, you know, give them interest in our projects. The last project that we have is Night Owl. <coughs> we drilled on the project last year. We completed <coughs> some uh, airborne and ground geophysics, and we are currently working with that same group from the University of Wyoming. They're going out and doing some more ground surveys on our project to help us define possibly where, where the mineralization is at. We, we were able to drill and find a little bit of it, but it is, it, it's more sparse than we were expecting. So we're, we're gonna be working with them on a geophysics thing to, to expand this project so we can um, take it to the next level and, and drill. So this has been our plan for the summer. At Agate, we've already completed 100 holes. We hope to complete another 50, you know, middle of the end of the next month. The Beaver Rim, we're gonna drill at least five holes. We're, we're bonded up to 10,000 feet. And then, of course, Night Owl, we're working on the geophysical and survey. The Beaver Rim project itself, we've, we're cleared for 50 drill holes. That would just been a large bond to put out. So we, we, we bonded for a lesser amount. But that just means next year we can just advance the project by increasing the reclamation bond at that time and, and just jump right into drilling. Same thing at Agate. We're, we're bonded still for another 100 holes. We'll drill 50 this year. And then next spring, then we have additional 50 holes we can drill. And then we'll have to advance the projects to the plan of operation state where it, it takes more intensive studies on the floral, faunal, archaeology, and those sorts of things. And lastly, here's, here's the main group. You got Deb, you got myself, you got John, you got Ryan, our CFO. We got a few other people with the company that are working great. Oh, there's another page. Yeah. There's our directors. We got Jordan Marion Loomis. He's, he's our most recent director. He was the uh, head of the uh, executive director and assistant director at time for 38 years with the Wyoming Mining Association, and that is a lobbying group essentially for for the state's Congress. And he knows everybody in the in the game, in uranium and coal and oil and gas and, and if there's gold companies, that sort of thing. So he's been a great um, addition to the company. And lastly, this is where we're at. We're sitting on about 1.8 million in cash. And that's where we're at. Any questions? Great. Thank you very much, uh, John, Terry, for a great presentation. So we will now turn it over to the Q&A portion of the <clears throat> webinar. Reminder to everybody online, you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. Uh, we already do have a few questions here, guys. So why don't I uh, kick them off here? Now, I guess just to start it all off, what, what really attracted Strathmore to the Gas Hills District and the Shirley Basin areas of Wyoming in particular, as opposed to other jurisdictions? Well, I think our biggest attraction uh, obviously is the uh, presence of uranium mineralization and the ability to, to permit uh, a mine and to develop these things. You know, the business atmosphere is uh, pro-development in Wyoming. You know, and, the, and one of the other issues that we, why we pick these areas, we're quite familiar with them. But also, these are federal, these are federal lands, federal minerals. So, once we stake them, those, those mineral rights are ours 100%. The Powder River Basin is a large area split title where landowners may not own their mineral rights. And that becomes a rather difficult area to uh, permit and to deal with different royalties and all that stuff. Royalties can be pretty high in some of these companies over on the, 
on the east side of the state. So we picked an area that we knew has mineralization on it. I drilled on Beaver Rim years ago in 2012. We drilled several dozen holes up on top. I know the mineralization's out there. We just need to go out and redefine it. Mm -hmm. so I imagine those two areas. Yeah, yeah, and I imagine working on federal land as well. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit easier than dealing with ranchers that are used to immediate royalties from oil companies. Is that correct? Well, the, yeah. the lack of royalty is a real advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, you know, some of the ranchers, like right now, they're in the middle of elk and deer and antelope season, so they they don't want drill rigs on their property. It's like, well, this is the ideal to go time to go drilling. So mm -hmm. I mean, a couple, friend of mine mentioned that the other day. So it's like we are about to get started drilling. And uh, it's going to be a good season, hopefully. Right, right. Okay. Now, ISR, the in-situ recovery method, really produces about half of the world's uranium. Why have you decided to focus on ISR potential rather than, than conventional for the most part? Well, a lot of it has to do with the ability to construct a mill. The trying to permit a mill, you know, we worked at Roca Honda for uh, six and a half years spent $37 million and we were at an impasse with the regulators, uh, the Native American community and the public. The public uh, 15 years ago was not the same public we're dealing with today. This public today has now realized what we've realized all along. Nuclear is a good green energy. Okay. Now, you are focused in and around the prolific uh, Shirley Basin. Why does Strathmore and other companies say this might be the best basin for ISR in the U.S.? Because <laughs> that was where the first commercial ISR production was done in the world. There are a lot of people that want to say Texas. It was done in Wyoming, and it was done at the property I worked on as a starting geologist. And I was actually able, in my tenure out there, to excavate through a previously, uh, we call it solutioned mined area. I saw the effects. I saw how effective it was, how good the sediments were, how amenable to ISR mining. And that's why Dev and I said, this is the direction we're taking. Yeah, and Dave, and one of the things that Shirley Basin is noted for is high porosity, high permeability, and high transmissivity of groundwater. It, it, it is notable for that. I think once UR Energy turns on their, their project, people will be readily surprised at how well that's going to work mm -hmm. and how, how much uranium they will pull out of the ground. Their project is five times the grade as their Lost Creek operation. It's over 0.2. You know, Lost Creek is averaging like 0607. I mean, that's a really nice project. And we're, you know, five, six miles away. Maybe we could build up a project and build a pipeline and put it at their facility. Mm -hmm. Or we'll just build a small little facility at our place. Yeah. And you're seeing these same attributes on the Agate project as well. We or hope so. Yeah, we yeah. haven't done any testing on 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 the water, you know, you know, the transmissivity or any of that stuff yet. We haven't done any groundwater testing or that sort of thing. But I have a feeling that it's going to be quite similar. When we drilled the first hole out there, the, the driller said, wow, this is fantastic sand for building a ground, you know, for a water well. So when they say that, and that, you know, these guys had drilled thousands and thousands and thousands of holes, we're pretty excited about it. And it's confined, yeah. our, our main deposit at Agate, it appears to be uh, confined between obviously a very thick shale and sand uh, clay below it and about a five to 10 foot clay between it and the, up uh, the middle sand above it. Mm -hmm. My first reaction when Terrence started drilling was, this is textbook ISR property. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, <laughs> Gary, you, you mentioned that you're looking at roll front mineralization within the water table. Now, why do you need to be below the water table, and what is it about roll fronts that really make them suitable for ISR? Well, you got to have water to suck the water out of the ground and, and oxidize the uranium. So, that you need to have a good head. Now, the fact that we're kind of shallow, that might um, might cause us to use some different lixivians. 
but we just don't know yet. That's for a chemist to figure out. I'm a geologist. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for uranium. And the roll front themselves, they were created by a geochemical, uh, by the groundwater itself moving through the system. So what we do is just reverse that. We reoxidize it and just pull it out of the ground. And like I said, we, we hit a 20-foot zone of 0.09. It's one of the highest GT holes that have been drilled if you look at all the juniors over the last year, it's a really nice little deposit we found. And it, hopefully we expand on it. And as we go further north, we only get deeper, which only would increase the head on the on the groundwater where you could dissolve more chemicals into it. That's ideal. Having the thickness below water table is a, a true benefit. You know, our GTs are such that uh, when you look at them, you would almost think that these were suitable for underground mining. When you look at the, the GTs on it, we'd need six feet of 10 or used to. And we've got GTs in excess of that on several of these holes. And uh, at the depth we're talking, you know, we're almost talking garden hoses. Right, right. Now, you, you've been drilling there. I think this is the second year of drilling there, you know, and great results. You, know, How big is the deposit now? You know, what are, what are you finding? Because you've, you've had some exceptional success. You know, a lot, most of your holes are hitting. Well, Terrence is looking at over 90 percent uh, mineralized holes in these areas where we have drilled. And he and I have talked a little bit. And this thing is looking more uh, amorphous than I had originally thought. The rolls are not as contained and uh, they're wider, they're thicker. Yeah. Lower grades, but that still gives you the same amount of pounds. And having that thickness to work with, with an ISR injection, gives you the ability to access all the pounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's something a lot of people are not able to do. They'll have uh, three or four feet or uh, something like that. Maybe a little higher grade, but we've got good GTs showing up here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these holes are carrying over 10,000 pounds at a, at a small area of influence. And, you know, when you start putting that against the price of uranium for drilling a few holes in the ground, sucking water out, that's attractive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, good GT means more uranium. And and as I think we've discussed before, grade isn't necessarily king when it comes to ISR, you know, no. porosity, no. permeability. It's all about moving water. right? It, yeah, we're pumping water. And, uh, you know, with that in mind, uh, having the thickness is very important. Mm -hmm. Great. And I saw that when I excavated over across the highway in Shirley Basin. Uh, we had a lot of channeling over there, a little localization uh, with the uh, lixiviance and everything. And we're not going to have that type of situation here. We're going to flood this uh, area. Yeah, you can, you can imagine at 150 feet how many wells you can put in. Mm -hmm. you, know, it, yeah. you don't need much. I mean, we could, no. we could we, we, like John is saying, you could go in there and flood this area. You know, all it takes is increase the thickness by two times and the group, you know, your resource increases, you know, yeah. double the width, double the length. You know, we, we've doubled our length on the, the Northern zone. You can see that the South zone and the Northern zone, they're both in the lower sand. We anticipate those two trends to join together. Mm -hmm. And then we have this new trend way on the Southeast that we only just started and it's open on all ends. And I'm, I'm excited to go down there and drill. The mineral started at 15 feet deep. It was it was it was crazy. We I had no idea we were going to find that. I was yeah, anticipating it to be 40, 50, 80 feet deep again, like the other ones were, but it wasn't. It was in the middle sand, and there is no mineral in that little deposit in the lower sand. So will it continue north? We don't know. It, 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 there was not much drilling by Kerr McGee over in that area. They kind of just were bouncing all over their project areas. They were drilling thousands and thousands and thousands of holes between us and, and the UEC and, and the, the land that UEC controls and that chemical controls. You see, it, it's, it's amazing that how much drilling there was done. And it, they yeah. obviously were finding something. So 
yeah, there's been a couple of new discoveries at Agate, so I guess this is one that you're you're talking about now. Can you maybe go into a little bit more depth about this? You know, step out. I think it's a one mile out uh, from from Agate, and and maybe the significance of that discovery. Well, I just wasn't expecting to find it in the middle sand. Everywhere on the map, if it showed mineral was in the middle sand, it was noted on the map. For instance, north of us on all their maps, they noted it in the middle sand. So they had a couple drill holes down there. We had the logs, but I couldn't read them. They were just black smudge. So I said, well, we just need to go down there and drill. And yeah, it's a mile away. You can see if this thing trends north and keeps trending north and gets deeper, we got a mile and a half, two miles of land to, to openly explore. And that area wasn't heavily explored by Kermit Gee. Even the area that we are extending on that, that northern trend where the, you know, it says trend extended over 3,700 feet. We got in there and Kermit Gee had no drilling in that area. We were hitting some really nice holes. I mean, 175 is seven and a half feet of 0.13. It's a really nice intercept of mineralization at 103 feet within that, that saturated sand zone. Agate has been a pleasant surprise, and uh, I, I guess I'd have to say I'm pretty pleased with what Terrence is finding. Great, great. When when might we uh, look for a resource estimate? When do you think you're prepared for that? No, oh, that, that's, that's something we would do this winter. You know, okay. we got to get a site visit. We we want to drill more. We want to add some coring, and then you go in and we we then do the modeling. So that's something we'll work on this winter. I, I do anticipate putting out together a mineral resources estimate on this report, hopefully. Realizing, of course, it's uh, constrained by the extent of our drilling right, right now. And every time Terrence pokes the hole down, we find mineralization. Yeah. Yeah. So make sure it's, uh, you know, people realize it's a pin in the pin in time, right? Just a point in time. Yep. It's going to Yeah. I, I think when we try to connect the dots here, we're going to have a, a very good experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Now, Strathmore Plus has an agreement with UR Energy. You know, potentially can help you fast track to production here. You know, we, we talked about UR Energy. It's uh, pro, it's constructing its Shirley Basin project, probably starting in the next, let's say, 18 months or so as a, a satellite plant, and they'll ship resin to the Lost Creek plant uh, across the uh, across the state. I guess what, what can you tell us about your development agreement with UR Energy? How might that help Strathmore? Well, obviously, it, it's a tremendous aid for us not to have to put the capital outlay for a plant, the permitting for that plant, uh, everything associated with an ISR plant. That is a, a big advantage. You know, when you start looking at the uh, economics on this deposit, uh, you know, if we had to build a, a complete plant, we'd have to obviously double this resource that mm -hmm. we're looking at right now. Having them across the road, having them with the expertise They've been doing this now, and they've been doing it successfully. You know, they've got personnel. Uh, our talks originally, well, maybe we'd use their personnel for some of our permitting. We haven't talked with them lately. They were pretty busy up until, well, right now, they're still very busy. How many, how many rigs do they have running right now, Terrence? At least 13, 14 at Lost Creek. There's at least two that I saw. A couple of weeks ago on the Shirley Basin project, they're they're drilling out their monitor wells. So we we haven't been uh, harassing them lately. We've been mm -hmm. sitting back a little bit, but uh, in the meantime, uh, I was doing a little work uh, on a processing type of agreement that we're going to be talking with them about, uh, and we'll have other discussions. Right now, we we needed to drill the agate project. You know, what we had last year was very tempting. What we have this year is basically down-to-earth solid geology. Mm -hmm. Okay. So moving on, we've got the Beaver Rim project that's uh, over in the Gas Hills area. You're going to work that shortly. What, what are your plans for that project? What are you looking for? Well, obviously, we're looking for uranium. Um like I said, I've drilled up there. I have some maps 
with trends on them since I've gone out and actually sat on the site and not just gone out and staked mining claims and actually started looking at it. There's far more drilling that was completed than on these, these few trend maps that we have. We've selected one spot to start at, and we're just going to go out and see what we find. It's, it's been 12 years since anyone's drilled up on Beaver Rim, as far as I know. I believe we were one of the last. Cameco might have been drilling up there. They were drilling up there as when, when we were drilling up there in 2012. And so the Beaver Rim project, it's, it's a large area of land that we now have. You know, let me go and find that slide. So you can see our property areas are, are you know, the, the North Sage is a mile long. I mean, that's a lot of land. And we just added, doubled that property size. The, the South Sage, that's where we're going to start. Last year, we were going to do some drilling, but the, the area had been extensively eroded and the roads were impassable in, in certain spots for drill rigs and water trucks. And so we're going to, that has, that, that erosion has kind of filled in. There's obviously some areas that we need to just get in there with a front loader and, and clean up the roads. So we'll be able to drill on our West Diamond. So we're going to, we will drill at least five holes on the project. We just need to be able to prove up that, yes, we have uranium on our project area and we will then advance the project more next year. I hope that we find some decent <clears throat> grades, some good thickness, and we can get some interest. You know, maybe this is a project UR Energy would like. UR Energy owns the big, the, the, the big former Lucky Mac pit. They own those properties up there. It's patented land, and they own some. They probably have three, four million pounds of uranium. Maybe there's some up there that they can lease. This is this area is gaining interest. Encore is supposed to be out there later on this year doing some operations, I believe. And Cameco, of course, that entire property, well, not all of it, but they were, they're were they fully permitted for in-situ mining. You couldn't ask for better neighbors than companies that have in-situ operations in the state. Right. And pretty good grades in that area. I think they what, they average about 0.25. Oh, yeah. and Well, I used to be in charge of all that that Cameco and everybody holds there. The remaining resources in the gas hills were under our control. And I'm very familiar with it was two shafts out there. We left two pits in ore when we uh, left the area. Mm -hmm. You know, we've looked at the resources, the UPZ, Muskrat, Blackstone trend, a uh, good underground trend. Cameco owns that now and they've got a permit on it. There's a lot of mineral in the gas hills left. And the areas that we own now, or control now, I guess, this is the area, these sediments are, are the conduit for the mineralizing solutions to all of the gas hills. So Terrence's optimism uh, is reflected in all of us. All right, okay. And uh, Night Owl, you know, this is your third project, a little bit different. It's uranium and limestone. Is that is the fact that it's different, a positive or a negative as far as potential? <laughs> I, I imagine a lot of people haven't been looking for that type of deposit, despite the fact there was some production from there. It's a learning experience. I'll just say that. Uh, Terrence went out there and did a recon initially. You saw the property. Mm -hmm. Uh we have not been able to figure out exactly what's going on. And the University of Wyoming is uh, helping us out there with geophysics. Uh, there's a lot to learn in order to develop this property. Right. Okay. So anyways, guys, thanks. Uh, let's maybe to wrap up any potential further M&A activity in Wyoming or really your, are your hands full with the your current expiration plans? Or what do you mean? We, we, we intend to keep expanding on our project areas where we, we where we believe that um, more mineralization is going to be. We Like I said, we staked 134 mining claims over the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, expanded on our project. We've doubled it in size. We have some more, some additional plans for agate in the Shirley Basin area and not just expanding on our project. There's a couple of new spots over there. We may, we may be looking at speaking of merger and acquisition. I mean, UEC uranium energy corp just announced yesterday. They're buying the, they're going to buy the uh, Rio Tinto Sweetwater mill, which is a, which is a large, 
conventional mill about an hour and a half south of our project area. You were asking about, you know, conventional mining in the future. Strathmore, the old one, we had all that land you can see on the dark other than on, on this map. That was all our, our land. That's all now controlled by Encore. We had probably 20 million pounds of, of historical and, and, and modern resources on our properties, the majority of which we were planning for open pit mining around Day Loma, the local Lee, all that land up to the north where it says Lucky Mac, Miracle Mile. There was a bunch of land in there that we were going to open pit. And then we realized there's some areas that are ideal for in-situ mining. And I believe that's what our Encore is obviously going to do. They're, they're in-situ miners. But the fact that there's another, there's a mill nearby, maybe some of these open pit assets can be mined down the road. Maybe they can be beneficiated up higher grade and then trucked down to the, to the new Sweetwater mill for processing. If the mill is going to be operated that way, UEC is obviously an in-situ miner, but some of their assets have are only conventional. Green Mountain is only a, is a conventional operation. They might be some areas in there that are in situ recoverable. The items around their mill site. UEC's got a huge land position. It's another good neighbor to have in the general area. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I, I think that the last uranium boom we saw, 2006, 2007, the original Strathmore was quite active in the Gas Hills area, but the mill wasn't active. And it wasn't uh, it wasn't in play. So I think things have changed a, a little bit this time around. Oh, that the mill was in play. We looked at it as a company. John and I toured with it. You know, a dozen of us went down there. It was almost bought out by Uranium One, and then they just you know Kennecott backed out of the deal. Rio Tinto backed out. So it has always been in play. I heard it was going to be decommissioned, and then then wondering what was going to go on with it. Everybody in Wyoming has been wondering what is going to go on with this big asset that is Green Mountain. That is the what is now UEC? It's it's a it's a large resource they bought, and it's mm -hmm. it it it's good to see. Like I said, more people in the game. It just gives us more options. It gives us more people to to um. How did I say it the other day? Fight over our deposits once we build them up and, and have a resource. And and yeah. it verifies our original thinking. Wyoming is a good place yep. to do business. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, well, let's wrap it up there, guys. I appreciate you talking to me. So we've got uh, John DeHoya and Terrence Ozier from uh, Strathmore Plus Energy. Thank you, guys. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. So thank you, everybody else, for tuning in. Our next webinar is on Thursday. That's September 26th, when I will be sitting down with Uranium Developer Forces Metals. So have a great day, everyone. And thank you for supporting Red Cloud's webinar series.